if you go into the fellowship hall, you'll notice that there's um, lots of stuff down there. And we are having a garage sale to support the Habitat build here in Chatfield this week. Um, and so if you'd like to come and help set up anytime during the week, the tables will get put up sometime today and tomorrow, and we'll just sort through everything. And we're not pricing anything except for the larger items. Um, so it's just a matter of getting things out on the table and displayed nicely. The sale will start on Friday at 9 o'clock and go until we don't have any more customers from around 5. And then we'll have another sale at another day, um, Saturday, from 9 to noon. So. And all help is welcome. Gracious Creator, you have known us before we ever knew you and have called us your children. Cultivate in us the courage to speak out and live your word of faith, hope, and love. The prelude this morning was more like you, Jesus, make me more like you, which was totally appropriate, Bobby, um, because that's what we're going to talk about today, how we can be more like Jesus, more like the Christ, in radical ways that might get us into trouble, but that will bring the light of Christ into the world as Christ comes into our midst. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. We give thanks to God who has created all that we have, and we sing praise to God who has created all that we are. Come, let us worship our God.
Let us pray together our prayer confession responsibly. Sometimes we are scared, O oh God. Other times we just don't know what to do. Most of the time we give in to our own wants, even when we know it's not what you want for us. We don't trust you in the way we know that we should. Show us your way, O oh God, that we may follow you faithfully, even when you lead us to the edge, to a place where the world tells us we should not go. And hear these words of assurance. God never asks us to go anywhere that God is not willing to go with us. We know that when we find the strength and the courage to trust, we will never be alone. God is greater than anything else in the world that tries to pull us away from God. The good news is that when we trust in God, we will discover courage and love and strength and abundance greater than anything we have ever known. Thanks be to God. is fulfilled. 
All who were present spoke favorably of him. They marveled at the eloquence of Jesus' words. They said, surely this isn't Mary and Joseph's son. Jesus said to them, undoubtedly, you'll quote me the proverb, physician, heal yourself, and say, do here in your own country the things we have heard you did in Capernaum. But the truth is, prophets never gain acceptance in their hometowns. The truth is, there were many women who were widowed in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens remained closed for three and a half years and a great famine spread over the land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but to a woman who had been widowed in Zephyrath near Sidon. We call too that many had leprosy in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet no one was cured except Naaman the Syrian. At these words, the whole audience in the synagogue was filled with indignation. They rose up and dragged Jesus out of town, leading him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built, with the intention of hurling him over the edge. But he moved straight through the crowd and walked away. The word of God for the people of God. <coughs> Thanks be to God. So do you ever say something and think, gosh, that was brilliant. And it's even better when others who have heard seem to think that it's brilliant also. You see it in the light in their eyes and the smile on their lips and realize you've said something that is meaningful and helpful and maybe even wise. That is a good feeling, especially right now. So I've read something about our waves of speaking to each other at, the po at this point of the pandemic, and it seems that texts on our phone are getting shorter, blunter, emails less frequent, phone calls less chatty. We are at a stage where we have said all that we can say. I wish I could see you more often. I wish I didn't have to stay away. I hope you stay well. We've said it all before, so our words are less. So when we do hear or say something moving and different and enlightening, we are lifted up. And when it comes out of our mouths, we are shocked and thankful. But then there are those times when we have said something brilliant and we see all the wonderful reactions from those around us, and we keep on talking. We don't just stop with the brilliant bit. We keep, keep on talking and begin to dig that hole. You know that hole that no matter how much we try, we can't dig ourselves out of. If only I'd stopped at the brilliant bit. If only our mouths would listen to our brains. If only we would see what we were doing to our listeners. If only we had stopped talking. Some of us have more problems with this than others. Some of Jesus' neighbors thought Jesus had this problem. If only he had sat down and stopped talking when everyone thought he was wise and brilliant and hopeful. If only he had left well enough alone. But sometimes more needs to be said, even if it makes people uncomfortable, even if it stirs the pot, even if it might result in a crucifixion. I kept thinking that the site that we use now that develops the slides for our scripture reading was not complete yet this week, so I kept refreshing the page, hoping for more slides. But there was just this only one. 
And I reproduced it on the front of your bulletin, although it's in black and white. This amazing icon of, a, of the crucifixion. And this was painted sometime in the 1560s in Egypt or Syria. It's got Arabic letters around it that's hard to read. I mean, even if you could read Arabic, it, it's hard to make them out. But like many of the crucifixion scenes from the early times of the church, the only ones around the cross as Jesus died are women, which is super significant for this passage of scripture. So back to this passage, Jesus is leaving the synagogue and people are all excited about his ministry. They had heard of all he had been doing in other towns and they wanted their town to have the same reputation. He was, after all, a hometown boy, Mary and Joseph's child from right here in Nazareth. And you can imagine, can't you, if one of Chatfield's sons or daughters was off doing miracles and such things in Stuartville, you would want them to come home and do the same thing right here, right? Okay, so Jesus could have told them all sorts of stories about how the ancient prophets helped the people of Israel, how they helped them remember the laws and love of God, how they reminded them of how to worship God rightly and justly, how the prophets told them that the best way to follow God was not to look for miracles, but was to do just, justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before their God, to care for the widow and the stranger, he could have told them all of that, but instead, he opened his mouth and reminded them that prophets were not really well liked, particularly by their own people, particularly when they were teaching in their home countries. So he wasn't expecting his hometown to like him very much. And then, to dig the hole even deeper, he reminded them that the prophets actually did miraculous things, which is really what the Nazarenes were, uh, Nazarenes were asking for. The prophets did miraculous things, but for people who were not even Israelites. A widow a foreign widow, a soldier, a foreign soldier who bowed down to foreign gods. And to make it even more impactful, Jesus reminded them that there were hungry people in Israel, that that famine at the time of Elijah, where he gave the widow of Zarephath the blessing of the food also was affecting the Hebrew people. And he reminded them that where there were plenty of skin diseased people in Israel when the great prophet Elisha gave Naaman the means to heal his own leprosy. Jesus reminded them that they weren't the only ones at the center of God's intentions. He reminded them of what the Hebrew people typically did to prophet, prophets. And he implied that he wasn't going to give them what they wanted and that they weren't going to like him. Jesus, in the mind of his neighbors, went too far. So they ran him out of town. Our text is very specific and a bit overblown. It says they rose up and dra dragged Jesus out of town, leading him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built with the intention of hurling him over the edge. The hill Nazareth is built on really isn't all that big. Jesus might have gotten a skinned knee or a bruised head from a toss over, side, over the side, but it probably wouldn't have killed him. Still, it isn't a very nice thing to drag a son of the town out of town. 
This telling of the story in Luke's gospel is to serve a very important person at this time in Jesus' ministry. Jesus himself is identifying himself as a prophet. He is putting himself into the same league as Elijah and Elisha, two very important prophets in the life of the Hebrew people. Even today, when Jews, when modern-day Jews sit down at table for the Passover meal, a place is set and a chair remains empty and a door in the room remains open, sometimes even the front door of the house so that the prophet Elijah might join them at their Passover table. Here in Luke, Jesus established himself, himself as another in the great line of prophets like Elijah, who is to come and sit at table and provide guidance <coughs> for God's people. Once again, just like last week's text, Jesus tells the people that he is come to fulfill the promises God has made with God's people. A prophet has arrived again for the nation of Israel, right here, right now, and he is even born in their hometown. Like all of the prophets before him, sent by God to be God's word in their midst. Jesus came to them right where they live. This would, be good, this would be good news, which the people were ready to hear and would have accepted, except Jesus went too far. Jesus reminds God's people that they are not the only people of God. That God's prophets come for foreign widows and strange God-worshipping soldiers and anyone else who hears and heeds the word of God. And what so often happens when that great invitation of God is put before us, God, pe people's egos get in the way, and God's word gets tossed out like the baby with the bathwater, and God's prophets go unheeded. And so we come back to the icon, to what happens to prophets, and to who remains at the feet of prophets when they are crucified. Four women, those whom society at that time and through many times, and sometimes even now, discounts and mislabels as too weak to be of any importance, as too vulnerable, too outside the potential to be of any use, too easily abused, too easily living just on the edge of society, four women at the foot of the cross. Jesus' words rarely impact those whose lives are comfortable, those who don't need a savior, those who don't need a word of hope, or even the more, those who can't see the need to confront the way society sets up barriers for other people's well-being. Those who think that life is only about pulling yourself up by, their, by your own bootstraps. Those who think that everyone has an equal chance at making it if they just try hard enough. Those who think people are generally lazy, sinful, and deserve everything they get, good or bad. Those are the ones who rarely impact, are rarely impacted by Jesus' words. Sometimes, I wish I were one of those people, the one who doesn't recognize the inequality that is woven into the fabric of any society. Sometimes I wish I was one of those people, the one who doesn't grieve when we hear of another refugee boat capsized in the ocean off the coast of Florida. 
Sometimes I wish I were one of those people, the one who isn't worried about what we are doing to the planet. Sometimes I wish I were one of those people who never says more than people can handle. Sometimes. But then I remember, I would rather be one of those people who is courageous enough to stand at the foot of the cross, like our four women, and see the suffering and attend to the dying and find out that in the midst of all of this ugliness and hatred and violence and suffering, there is a resurrection. I would rather be that person who hears all the word, words of Jesus, even the ones that will take him to the cross, especially the ones that will take him to that cross. The words that will nail his body to a piece of wood because they are too difficult for many people to hear, and so they try to stop them. You've gone too far, Jesus. This is what the cross tells us. You have opened your mouth and we didn't like what we heard, so we are going to run you out of town. We are going to shut you up. We are going to make you stop. And there will be those who will turn away from the cross and never hear another word again. But I'm not that person. And I hope you aren't that person either. No matter how hard the words are, no matter how difficult the suffering those words reveal, no matter how deeply convicting those words enter into our souls, no matter how much those words move our hearts to break, I would rather be the person who hears all Jesus has to say, who hears them and then speaks so that others can hear. And maybe if enough of us hear and speak these words, we will finally get to the place where we will stop killing the prophets. Stop nailing good men and women to trees. Stop shutting people up who are trying to get us to pay attention to what God wants this world to become. And maybe, just maybe, we will finally, truly have ears open to the words of love which Jesus speaks into our spirits each and every day because God's word will not be shut up. It is the word of life, and it is the word of hope, and it is given to us freely.
Oh, Holy One, being a Christian is risky business. You ask of us to follow you, and sometimes we find ourselves standing on the edge, afraid that we are going to fall over. But you've been there before us. You have stood on the edge for what you believed and what you proclaimed. There is nothing that we are asked to bear or endure that you do not understand. You cannot promise us that everything will turn out the way we want it to, but you do promise us that you will stand with us at all the prefaces of our lives as well as those times when we think we are on stable ground and have all the answers. But maybe we don't. Yes, being a Christian is risky business. Thank you for being on this journey with us and for leading and guiding us along the way. Thank you for teaching us all we need to know, for speaking into our hearts all we need to say, and for teaching us to pray. Our loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the dominion, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. blessing responsibly one to another. God's call to us drives us to the edge, to places of hurting, to places of need. In those places we find hope and help because we are not alone. God goes with us. Together we go out to serve all those edgy places where we are called to serve, ever mindful that we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. 
May you go out today knowing that God's grace and love goes with you so that in all you do and say, you can bring glory to God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Amen.